Well, my name is Jim, if we haven't met yet, and one of the pastors on staff. I think I got around to say hello to most of you today. I was glad to see a lot of you were able to make it in that normally would join us online since uh, internet seems to be down, not just here at the church, but in a broad, in a wide ranging area. So good to see you here. And uh, just want to say that we are uh, recording this today and we will um, rebroadcast this later through our website. So we'll be available. So if you know friends that weren't able to join, you can let them know that it will be up uh, later today or tomorrow and it will be available for folks to uh, watch then as well. But uh, just want to welcome you again to Parking Lot Worship, and uh, really glad you're here. We have a beautiful morning today. Last week was a little rough. If you were here, uh, I lost a couple pounds of sweat, I think, before the morning was over. I don't have a lot to lose, but uh, it, was good. it was good to be here anyway. And uh, as Jody mentioned, we'll be here for the next couple weeks, and uh, looking forward to having you here as we uh, move into September already, um, which is hard to believe it's just uh, next weekend. Or actually, it's Tuesday, I guess. So it's only two days away. So we'll be in into September and the fall is upon us. But uh, I want to talk to you today about something that's really uh, pa I'm passionate about. It's something that I, I uh, read a lot about that I um, am very, again, very passionate about. And it's the idea of community. The idea of being connected as a church family and how that really plays into the growth, into our growth as believers, as followers of Jesus. I don't know if you've ever heard of Gallup polls or George Gallup. Uh, he does, and his group does a lot of surveys, especially around church and around faith items. Uh, well, a few years back, it was I think it was 2016, after he was doing some surveys, Gallup came out with um, an article, and he said in this article that Americans are among the loneliest people in the world. He said Americans are among the loneliest people in the world. Now that's kind of hard to imagine, uh, especially in our day and age when you think about all the ways we have to connect with social media. We have Facebook, we have Instagram, we have Snapchat, we have Twitter, although I think Twitter's on its way out. We have texting, we have FaceTime, we can Zoom now. Who hasn't Zoomed? I'm, I'm tired of Zooming. I'd rather be in person. And believe it or not, we can still use the phone and call people. It still works. It's not attached to the cable on the wall anymore, but we can still call people and talk to them in person. But the sad reality is, and research is showing this, that as a people, especially Americans, that we feel more alone than ever in our culture. Um, and let's be real, our whole situation with COVID has not helped that at all. Uh, being distanced and quarantined for so long um, now I think more than ever we feel that loneliness in our lives. Um, Henry Cloud, Christian author, has written a number of books, a speaker. He says that people's most basic need in life is relationship. And that the clear teaching of the New Testament is that the body of Christ is to be people deeply connected to each other. Did you catch that? That the clear teaching of the New Testament is that the body of Christ is to be people deeply connected connected to each other and he goes on to say that by inviting people into relationship with others in the church we are taking the next step in giving them the best possible opportunity to become fully developing followers of Christ by inviting them into relationship with us we are giving people the next step of the best possible opportunity to grow to become fully developing followers of Jesus Christ. And notice he doesn't say that it's inviting them to programs, inviting them to events, although those are good things, right? Those are good things. Those are very good things. And sometimes they serve as a vehicle for connection. But the key, the underlying key to growing in our faith is entering into relationship with others in the church. It's entering into relationship with one another. If we wanna grow in our faith, we have to be in relationship with each other, doing this together. Our faith is formed, and I believe this, because I've seen this over 30 years of being a Christian now, 
that being in community, being in relationship with other people, doing this life together, joining, sharing, praying together, that God works in that process. And he works in that process to shape us and to mold us into his likeness. In short, we are better together, right? We're better together. That's what scripture tells us. That's what the teaching of the New Testament, that's what the teaching of all of the Bible teaches us, is that we are better together as a people. So today, I want to read out of Ephesians chapter 3. You may have never read this passage in this way, but I want to encourage you to think about it differently today as we uh, read together. If you brought your Bible, you can read along. We'll be in chapter 3, verse 16 of Ephesians. This is Paul writing, and this is what Paul says. Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, that he, he being God, Jesus, may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, and I always like to think of that as in Christ's love, that we may have power together with all the Lord's people, and some translations say his holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, the one thing I want to point out about this passage, and, and um, I think it's easy to miss this, because I've missed it for so many years. It's about who this passage is for, who it's meant to speak to. Because I think the tendency is to read this as if it were just for me. It was all about me. That it was about my life. It was about my own individual faith. And I just want to say that's a modern construct. That's a more recent thing in the last 150, 200 years. That's not the way the early church would have read a passage like this. To think of our faith as only being about me would have been unheard of. Especially for an early Jew like Paul was writing to an early Gentile believer in the church like Paul was speaking to, to, to think about this as only being for an individual would not have been something they would have thought about. It's a modern construct that we've come to recently because the truth is it's speaking about relationship. It's speaking about being in community. If you flip back just a couple page, pages to the beginning of Ephesians, back to the beginning of this book, and actually, if you, as you know, this is not a book, right? It's a letter. It's a letter that Paul wrote. But in Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul starts off like this. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. So who was Paul addressing? Who was he speaking to? He was speaking to a group of people. He was speaking to a gathering of new believers in Jesus that were living in the city of Ephesus, his Greek city. It was a letter to this local church body, maybe just like us. So hear it this way. Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Perrysburg, the faithful in Christ Jesus at Perrysburg First Church. Hear it that way as if he's saying it today. And as Paul writes this letter, these are people that he loves, people that he cares for. And so he's writing them to instruct them how to live out their faith together. These new believers, this is a new thing for them. How do they do this together? What does it look like? So Paul's saying, this is how you do it. This is how you grow to love God. This is how you grow to love others more fully. It was never intended really intended for this to be read and understood only individually, apart from the community. And the you that you see here in this passage is plural. I lived in the South for, we lived in Kentucky for about six or seven years. It's y'all down there, right? If you've been down to the South, it's y'all. And if it's a plural y'all, it's all y'all. 
All y'all. All y'all and sweet tea. Two of the best things of the South. Right? They know sweet tea. We don't know sweet tea in the North. Now, I, I want to say God does use his word to speak to us personally. It is, he does do that to encourage and equip us as we walk with him. You know, the gospel, the good news of Jesus is very personal. But if we limit ourselves to that understanding only, then we miss out on some of the power, some of the richness in his word that he has for us. And we only come away with an incomplete picture. Our personal faith is always worked out in relationship, in community with other people. Always is. That's the way God designed it to be. We need each other. We are truly better together. We truly are better together. So when we read this, a passage like this, we also need to read it from the standpoint of being in relationship with one another. And then to see how God is instructing us as the body of believers here to live out our faith in community. So with that in mind, let's look at three things and how they inform us in creating a community of believers that's connected in meaningful ways to one another as we're growing in our faith together. First thing, found in verse 16. And the wind's playing havoc with my pages, so bear with me. So verse 16, Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So community begins with, it originates from God's glorious riches. It's a gift from God. If you look all the way back in Genesis to when God's creating in verses 26 and 27, God says, let us make human beings in our image, in our likeness. Now, who is he saying when he's saying our? He's talking about the Trinity, what we know as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So out of that graciousness, out of his richness, God created each one of us in his image. So we carry within us that very imprint of God's nature. And what's deeply grounded in God's nature? It's community. It's relationship. Again, it's the Father, it's the Son, it's the Holy Spirit living together in community. You probably can't see this well, but this is an icon, uh, a Byzantine icon I keep in my office. It's of the whole, it's of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit sitting around the table together. If you notice in the center, there's a cup. They're sharing a meal together. This is unity. There's this fellowship happening in this moment. And right here in the front is an empty seat. It's an invitation for us to join in the fellowship that our triune God is sharing together. Do you see the beauty of that? What this represents for us? God inviting us, us, to share in the community that he shares within himself. It's the greatest, one of the greatest gifts I think we've ever been offered. So community flows from who God is. And he wanted to share that with us, to invite us into it, because he wanted us to enjoy that too. It's a gift of God. It's stamped on our lives. It's part of our DNA. It's part of our DNA, our DNA excuse me, and it defines us. So if we're to know God, we're to know community as well. Again, think of it this way, uh, this gift that we've been given. So suppose, uh, hypothetically, you were given a gift for your uh, birthday, for Father's Day. I think it was Father's Day. Again, hypothetically, of a, a ride in a, a Waco plane. Anybody a, an aviator, you know what Waco planes are. They're a special plane. We, where we lived in Troy, there was a special uh, airport where these special planes came in. Anyway, they, they flew biplanes every weekend around our neighborhood, and you could get a ride in one of these biplanes. And so, again, hypothetically, suppose you got a gift of a biplane ride on one of these planes that you've always wanted to do. Now, it's a great gift, right? If you've always wanted to do that, you see it every weekend. 
but again, hypothetically, suppose you never actually redeemed your certificate that you got as the gift, uh, that you never just got over there before you moved. And so now you didn't actually use the gift you were been given. So did you actually receive it? You received it, but did you actually put it into use? So if God gives us this gift of himself, of community, and we never put it into use, have we actually received it? Have we actually accepted the gift in the way that he meant us to accept it? Out of love. Out of love. So we've got this gift. God invites us to walk into it. Our response is to join with him, join with each other, and live this out. Second thing I want to look at is the second half of verse 16. That he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So the power, the ability to live as a community of faith, to be committed to one another, growing in our faith together, it begins with it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. We don't have to create it on our own. He works to bring this about. One of my favorite books of the Bible is the book of Acts. You know why that is? It's because it's the story of the birth of the church. And I love, I love reading how the early church just exploded, how it grew, how people were being radically changed by the gospel. I love reading how they committed uh, to one another and how committed they were to one another, how God was powerfully at work in their lives. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I uh, preached out of Acts 2. Uh, you might remember that, 2.42 uh, through 47. I want to read that for you again. This is what we find about the early church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What happened to this group of people? What happened to these believers to cause this kind of radical transformation, this kind of commitment to one another? Just look back a couple verses, a couple chapters in Acts 2. If you go back to uh, verses 1 through 4, especially verse 4, they were all together. Well, I'll start at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit enabled them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what happened. That's what changed them. They had experienced firsthand what we just read in Ephesians 3.16. That the strengthening with power through the Spirit in their inner being happened to them. And Christ was now powerfully at work, dwelling in their midst, in their hearts, through faith. And through that, thousands of lives were being changed. If you read the first day that Peter shared the gospel, 3,000 people came to Christ. The power of the Holy Spirit is the real game changer. Ohio State fans like to say the Ohio State University. Well, this is the Holy Spirit that we're talking about. The real game changers. And I knew the Buckeyes would like that. The Wolverine fans moan, but that's okay. They're used to moaning from the results the last however many years. You're, stay if you're a Wolverine fan. Just stay. We still love you. But the real thing that makes a difference in this community is the Holy Spirit. See, we're, we're to be a spirit-led people. That's what the church is to be. We're to be spirit-led. That's what sets us apart from other 
social groups or fraternal groups. They're not spirit-led. The church is endowed, it's called to be spirit-led. And because we have the Holy Spirit living within us, friends, we have the power to speak life and hope and peace and love to each other. Amen? We have that power to speak those words. Our words have the power to bring life, to create. But our words also have the power to destroy and to tear down. How we use them makes a difference. As the body of Christ, we're to use our words in the power of the Spirit to speak life to one another. The last three or four years, Amy and I have gone to a conference in Nashville every September um, called the New Room Conference. Um, I've never been to a place that's more full of the Holy Spirit, especially with a bunch of Methodist pastors there. Um, it's been amazing to be there and experience firsthand when people are drawn together, hungry, hungry for more of God, how God shows up in that place. And I've just been blown away every year by the worship, by the teaching, by the preaching, by the prayer. Evening worship services that last two and a half hours because nobody wants to leave. And the prayer just keeps getting poured out. But the one thing that brings this group together, the one thing that they're focused on is doing life together. It's about the original thing that became, that became uh, allowed Methodists to become Methodists. Wesley bands, which are small groups that meet, class meetings, they were called, that met together. Do you know that First Church started in 1819, just down the road, as a Wesley class meeting, as a small group? That's the history of this congregation. We started as an expression of this kind of community, drawing together to seek God in our life. That is our tradition. That, we should be proud of that. That's a rich heritage that we have that formed this body of believers. It's part of our DNA as First Church. One of the speakers a couple years ago said this. It stuck with me. He said, most people get stuck in their faith because they're isolated, thinking and believing that they don't need others to grow. It's just about me and Jesus, me and Jesus. Again, that's nowhere to be found in Scripture. And they're not in meaningful relationship where faith is being worked out. We need each other. Amen? We need each other. We need to work out our faith together. The Holy Spirit is the catalyst to that growth. When two or three are gathered in his name, God does amazing things and he shows up and he brings about life change. Third point, final point, verse 19. Paul ends by saying, we are to know the boundless nature of Christ's love so that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And that's the why of community. That we might know the vastness of the love of Jesus Christ and to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, all the good things of God, that they would fill us so much so that they would overflow out of our lives and into the, uh, the lives of others. So let me uh, just suggest this. If we want to be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit, if we want Christ to dwell in our hearts through faith, if we want to be rooted and established in love, in God's love, if we want to have power together to grasp just how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Jesus, if we want to know the love of God in a way that surpasses all of our knowledge, and if we want to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, then we have to be willing to engage in faith-forming community. Because apart from intentionally being connected with other people on this journey of faith, working this out together, we'll never know any of these to the fullness that they're available to us. It's not that we won't know them, but we won't know them to the fullness that God is making them available to us. Because we are better together, and we need each other. 
Amy and I have been in different small groups over the years, small groups, um, Sunday school groups, lots of different groups in different places. And I can tell you, those have been instrumental in my growth as a follower of Jesus. I don't think I'd be where I am today without those folks in my life. In fact, it was in a group at our uh, a church in Piqua where I first felt my call to pastoral ministry. It was in a group of people and they affirmed that calling within me. It's crucial for our faith to be involved in a group. We've been created in the image of a relational God. We have his imprint of community stamped on us, like I was sharing earlier, it's stamped in our souls. It's a gift of God. It's a gift of him himself to us. And not only is he the author and the creator, but he's also the provider of community through the power of his Holy Spirit. And here's the thing. Sometimes we have to risk being known in order to risk being loved. Sometimes we just have to risk being known if we want to risk being loved. Because in groups, we learn to know and be known, to love and be loved, and to serve and be served. You know, it's unlikely that we're going to deepen our relationship with God in a casual or haphazard manner. There's going to be a need for some intentional commitment, for some reorganization in our lives. But there's nothing that will enrich our lives more. So just let me ask, how might God be calling you to get connected? And I know it's hard right now because we can't really be together, but we can be together. We're starting some groups. We're doing it safely, social distancing as we meet. We're working to organize some more this fall. Uh, Andrea already has three that she's involved with. I know others of you are in groups. You can meet over Zoom. You can use FaceTime. You can meet outside in a parking lot like this and meet uh, responsibly and care for each other's health as you do that. But folks, we're called to be together. We're called to do this life of faith together. Remember, community is God's idea. It's a gift of himself to each one of us. The role of the Holy Spirit is to empower and to form a group of people that want to follow Jesus into a community of faith that's being formed so that we can grow together so that we learn to more fully love God and to love others. I think we truly are better together. Amen? Amen.